Hello and welcome to the Amateur Radio Technician License course. This is Lesson 1, Part 3. Well, let's get started. I'm your instructor, uh, Gary Stevens, uh, KE2GS. We'll begin by defining what a control operator is. A control operator is basically the person that pushes the push to talk button or keys the transmitter. Uh, so the, the true definition is it's an uh, amateur operator uh, designated by the licensee of a station to be responsible for the transmissions of the amateur station. So a control operator is the one pushing the key, uh, but in the case of a repeater operation, there's uh, nobody there. Uh, so the person that presses the key that keys the transmitter on the uh, repeater is actually the control operator of the repeater. So, for example, if the car on the left pushes their push to talk, it will open the, the repeater uh, and uh, it will transmit to the uh, vehicle on the uh, right. Uh, so the person on the left will be the control operator. And if the person on the right replies, uh, they would uh, be the uh, remote operator or the control operator uh, during the time that they have it keyed. So the test question is, an amateur station is never permitted to transmit without a control operator. And that includes, uh, you know, if you're not around, you leave your equipment on and, and your pet comes and accidentally keys your transmitter, uh, you could not uh, designate them as a control operator. Uh, you have to designate somebody that has a license uh, themselves uh, to be the responsible party. Another test question is the station licensee must designate the station control operator. It's easy to remember that you have full privileges uh, from uh, 30 megahertz and up. Um, however, you need to know your uh, restrictions uh, for your technician class uh, in the HF area. Uh, HF bands. So uh, 80 meters, 40 meters, and 15 meters, you have a restricted area where you can uh, perform CW or Morse code. And the same thing is true on 10 meters. Uh, there's uh, a narrow portion of the band where you're allowed to do the CW or uh, data, uh, as well as uh, your phone privileges. Uh, so the question is, uh, the class operator license held by a control operator determines the transmitting privileges of the amateur station. So to answer the next question, we need to understand a little bit about st satellite communications. Uh, there's a concept of uplink and downlink. Uh, so uplink is just simply the uh, frequency or the, uh, the band that you're transmitting up to the satellite. And the downlink is the opposite. It's the uh, receive side on your, uh, on Earth, but it's actually the transmit side on the satellite. Uh, so there's typically a mode. It's a UV mode, for example. Um, so the UV uh, would be an uplink with the UHF and a downlink of VHF. Uh, so knowing that uh, helps you understand what your uh, operating privilege is. Uh, now, to my knowledge, uh, all, uh, all modern satellites uh, are uh, 30 megahertz and above, so a technician should be able to operate all uh, satellites uh, at this point in time. That being said, it's your responsibility to ensure that you have the privilege for that mode. So the question is, any amateur whose license privileges allow them to transmit on the satellite uplink frequency uh, maybe the control operator of the station communicating through an amateur uh, satellite or space station. So again, the uh, place where you key the transmitter uh, or push the button is the, uh, uh, where the control function is being performed. Uh, so as a control operator, uh, you're managing the, the transmitter, whether it be uh, your uh, device, uh, your transceiver, or uh, the repeater or space station, uh, if you're pushing the button that makes it work, uh, you're the control operator and the location you are in is where that function is being for, for performed. So the question is, uh, the location at which the control operator function is performed 
is the amateur station control point. Uh, as a uh, technician licensed uh, holder, you have to be careful not to uh, transmit out of band. Uh, it's uh, one quick way to lose your license or to uh, be heavily fined or both. Uh, so in order to avoid that, uh, you know, ensure that you're operating within the constraints of your license. Um, the uh, ARRL website, uh, ARRL.org, um, has uh, uh, this band chart, um, or band plan chart, uh, that allows you to uh, gauge what your uh, privileges are and what the uh, privileges of the other licensees are. Uh, so I highly recommend that you uh, take advantage of uh, this, download it, uh, print it out, have it at your disposal. Uh, so the question is, at no time under normal circumstances may a technician class licensee be the control operator of a station operating an exclusive amateur extra operator segment of the amateur bands. Now sometimes uh, you may be the control operator, but you may not be the station licensee. Uh, for example, if you're a member of a club and the club owns, say, uh, uh, a uh, transmitter or a transceiver uh, in a clubhouse um, and it has a station license and you're broadcasting as that station, uh, say that the club is uh, K5ABC um, and your licensee is uh, or your license is uh, KD5XYZ, uh, you may want to use the call sign of the club uh, to make contacts, uh, but you are uh, acting as yourself. Um, so the question for this would be uh, when a control operator is not the station licensee, the control uh, operator and the station licensee are equally responsible for the proper operation of the station. By definition, automatic control is uh, an engineering term that covers uh, mechanisms of operation uh, that does not require human intervention. Uh, so a repeater falls into that category. Uh, it runs autonomously. Nobody has to sit over it. Uh, it, it just works uh, automatically. So uh, the question is, repeater operation is an example of automatic control. By contrast, uh, remote control uh, has to do with uh, controlling a device or a machine uh, from a distance. This generally infers uh, using an apparatus uh, such as a, a radio or some type of electronic device. So the question is, the following is true of remote control operation. The control operator must be at a control point. The control operator is required at all times. And a control operator indirectly manipulates the controls. So we spoke about the uh, automatic control of a repeater that uh, is when uh, you're uh, transmitting and the receive side of the uh, 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 repeater picks up that signal and then automatically repeats it. The uh, repeater can also be manipulated uh, over the internet if it's uh, linked to a system such as uh, Echolink, uh, which uses the uh, you know, the internet uh, remote link uh, protocols. Uh, in this particular case, uh, you're not, uh, it's not automatically keying. Uh, it's being manipulated when you press uh, the space bar or whatever other control you've, you've selected to, uh, to key, the peer, uh, key the repeater. So the question is, operating the station over the internet as an example of the remote control is defined in part 97. So unless you have something in writing to the contrary, uh, it's assumed uh, that you are the station's licensee. So the question is, the question reads, uh, the FCC presumes the station licensee to be the control operator of the amateur station unless documentation to the contrary is in the station records. So the FCC can come uh, request a look at your station records or logs uh, anytime they want to. Um, to my knowledge, I, I have personally not uh, 
uh, heard of anybody that has had the FCC knocking on their door, but it could happen. Uh, so keeping good records is uh, a good thing, uh, particularly if you're making contacts uh, to uh, places overseas. Uh, so the question is, uh, or reads, uh, at any time upon request by an FCC representative, the station licensee make the station and its records available for FCC inspection. So amateur radio operators are often called upon or volunteer uh, to help out in uh, very community uh, service activities, uh, such as uh, a marathon, for example. Uh, so during a marathon, uh, you may not want to use your call sign. Uh, you'd use a tactical identifier, uh, such as race headquarters or uh, uh, starting line or finish line. Uh, but during such events, if we elect to uh, use the tactical identifiers or we're requested to do so, we still have to adhere to the prime directive and give our station ID every 10 minutes, uh, which is your call sign and you have to do that at the end of the communication as well. Another question on identification. Uh, an amateur station required to transmit uh, its assigned uh, call sign at least every 10 minutes during and at the end of the communication. Uh, it should be noted, you know, a lot of people when they, they uh, get on the air, especially on repeaters, they will give their call sign. Uh, that's a, a courtesy. It's not necessary to do so. Uh, you're not required to give your call sign at the beginning. Uh, it's, it's a good practice, but you're not required. Uh, but you are required to give uh, your call sign every 10 minutes and at the end of each communication. Now, there's no requirement of what language you speak when you're using the radio. Uh, if you're talking to somebody in Spain and you know Spanish, that's perfectly acceptable. However, when you get to uh, giving your call sign, uh, the call sign is expected to be given in English. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, rule is always give your call sign in English. So the, the question is, uh, the English language is the... Uh, an acceptable language to use uh, for station identification when operating in a phone subband. Uh, that said, uh, you are also allowed to give your station identification in Morse code if your equipment uh, performs that task for you. So that segues into the next question. Uh, send the call sign using a CW or phone emission is a method of Call sign identification is required for uh, station transmitting phone signals. At some point, you may be asked to uh, work a special event station. Uh, this could be a, a lighthouse a battle station or some club event, uh, something at work possibly. Um, and uh, you would want to use some type of uh, self-assigned uh, indicator perhaps uh, to, you know, for the log's sake, uh, so you know who talked to whom. Uh, so what you would do is, uh, you know, the KL7CC slash W3, W3 may be uh, worker three, but the slash uh, could be uh, also uh, slash, slant, or stroke. So it would go something like this. The following formats of a self-assigned indicator acceptable when identifying uh, using a phone transmission, uh, KL7CC stroke W3, KL7CC slant W3, or KL7CC slash W3. There may be times uh, in your ham career that you're uh, asked by some uh, friend or relative to contact somebody in another country, uh, particularly after a disaster, and find out, uh, uh, you know, their uh, whereabouts or if they survived or uh, their, uh, you know, wellness. Um, so before doing that, you definitely want to make sure that there's a, a third-party agreement in place. Um, you can look at uh, the uh, ARRL website of uh, listed the uh, URL for the third-party agreements that are in effect today. Uh, so <clears throat> if you do that, uh, make sure that uh, the country has an agreement uh, so that you can satisfy the international law. 
So the question is, the foreign station must be one of which the U.S. has a third-party agreement in the restriction that applies when uh, the non-licensed person is allowed to speak to a foreign station using a station under the control of the technician licensed operator. A similar test question is a message from a control operator to another amateur station control operator on behalf of another person is meant by the term third-party communication. As we spoke of before, a repeater is something that uh, works automatically. Uh, so this question is, a repeater station is a type of amateur station uh, the si that simultaneously retransmits a signal of another amateur station on a different channel or channels. Because of the automatic uh, nature of a uh, repeater, uh, the repeater licensee cannot be uh, held responsible or liable for uh, the inadvertent or malicious activities of uh, the users of that repeater. Uh, so the question is, uh, the control operator of the originating station is accountable should the repeater inadvertently retransmit communications that violate FCC rules. Uh, that could be music, it could be foul language, it could be uh, you know your passenger uh, talking while you you know saying something while you're you're holding down the key. Uh, so just be aware that uh, uh, when you have the key held or you're pressing the key, you're responsible for whatever goes through that microphone and into the airways. And the last uh, question in this section deals with uh, clubs. Uh, for the issuance of a club station uh, license. Uh, there has to be at least four members of the club, so if you want to uh, have a repeater and, uh, you know, make it your club repeater or have a club call sign, uh, you have to have at least four people. Uh, for example, uh, K2BNL is uh, the Brookhaven National Laboratory Club uh, repeater, uh, and it's their station call sign, so... Uh, so the question is, uh, the requirements for the issuance of a club station license grant is that a club must have four members, at least four members. Uh, so just remember, four members to a club, you get a license. So that concludes part one. Uh, part one has uh, six questions on the exam. Out of the 35 questions, six are from part one. It uh, roughly equates to 17% of the, the exam. Uh, and then coming up in part two, we're going to talk about operating procedures. See you then.